Sure. Great. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who I have followed, and I can honestly say that I'm a fan of her and her work, and be even even more of a fan uh, after this conversation, I know for a fact. <laughs> but her name is Dr. <laughs> Sarah Godfrey. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's a board-certified physician who graduated from, get this, Harvard and MIT. So, I mean, I'm... Yeah, far out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> intelligence just going crazy here. She practices evidence-based integrative precision and functional medicine. She's a clinical assistant, a professor in the Department of Integrative Medicine uh, and Nutritional Sciences at Thomas Jefferson University. And she's a director of precision medicine at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health. She has written four New York Times bestselling books just to add to the ever-growing accolade list that she's got, including her latest book, which we're no doubt going to talk about today, which is very interesting, Women, Food, and Hormones. Uh, Dr. Godfrey, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thanks, Jay. So happy to be with you. I'm happy to have you here on the show. Now, your bio is even longer than what I just read out, and your work is honestly astounding. I guess it just, it's really long, but I, I love it. Um, there's so many fascinating things uh, that we could cover during this conversation. But before we do all that, my very first question for you is a question that I love asking all my guests at the very, very start, which is what does success look like for you? Love that question. I feel like what I've come to is that success is peace. Mm. Success is this abiding sense of peace, not situational peace, not, you know, peace based on external circumstances, but this inner sense of abiding peace. Mm -hmm. And from that peace is service. So I think the success for me, the way I define it is peace together with service from that place of peace. When was the moment for you that you realized that success was peace and flowing from that being of service? Has it been this gradual thing over the course of your life that you've realized it at different moments or was there more of a catalyst moment for you? I'd say both. Oh. So I, you know, I've had moments of understanding this as I was growing up, you know, practicing yoga with my great grandmother or um, I started doing transcendental meditation when I was 17 wow. and in college. Um, but it, you know, for me, it, it came to a, a catalyst moment when I was in my 30s. And I, I realized I really was not peaceful. Like I, I was at this place in my life where my hormones were a hot mess. I was a total stress case. I had my glucose levels kind of all over the place. Mm. I was metabolically unhealthy. And that's where I kind of started to take on my hormones. That was the portal through which I started to do precision medicine. Mm. But really, ultimately, when you look at the control system for your hormones, when you look at the control system for what I think of as your kind of neurohormonal dashboards or the way that you interact with the world, that piece is such an important element. So that's how I'd say I've arrived at it. And then you and I were talking before you hit the record button about psychedelic medicine, which I think is another way of accessing that piece. And certainly, you know, what we're seeing scientifically is this revolution where we really understand that people who are driven by trauma, who are driven by you know, maybe health issues that just, they just can't resolve. Trauma is often at the root of that. And the more that you can resolve trauma, it then gets you to that place of abiding peace. So I would say all of these things are connected, but certainly my, my work with precision medicine, even working with professional athletes and um, all different types of folks over the past 25, 30 years this this place of healing, of deep healing that leads to peace, 
that's my ultimate goal. That's my, my definition of success for my patients. I have heard of uh, psychedelic medicine being used to heal people from trauma. And I, I personally haven't tried it, uh, but I have heard of stories of how it's worked for a lot of people and how it's just helped them go really, really deep into their psyche and into those past wounds and then actually work on healing them. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the, the whole aspect of peace. Now, in a modern day and age where we're going a million miles an hour, there's a lot of things going on. You mentioned that your hormones were running amok. I mean, my hormones are running amok and I'm a guy. I've got a lot of friends of mine that are running amok. Is it, let me, let me ask you this first. What does inner peace really look like and how can we get there? It's such a good question. I, I think one of our goals, one of our tasks is to define that personally. So I can tell you as someone who creates these dashboards for every single one of my patients, you know, when I was looking at my patients that I've got scheduled tomorrow, I've got some executives, I've got some uh, National Basketball Association players, I've got um you know, a lot of different folks that I'm working with. And I can see like one patient in particular that I'm thinking of is a, a 42 year old woman. She's got three kids. She's a dentist. And she came to me just saying, my hormones are a hot mess. I need help. Libido's low. My thyroid doesn't work. Mm. I'm exhausted all the time. Like, can you help me kind of tune this up? And when I look at her genetics and I look at her blood work and we kind of put these two things together, what I see is that she's depleted. Yeah. And so the more that we can work with getting her genetics kind of lined up with her environment, mm -hmm. you know, maybe she's working too much. Um, maybe she's, She's got uh, some issues with detoxification. She's got some history of trauma that she could address. She's got some blood sugar issues, which are very commonly associated with thyroid dysfunction. So to get back to your question, how do you define this piece? From a scientific perspective, you could define it with homeostasis. You know, homeostasis is just a fancy word for balance, yeah. where you've got a system that can be sort of jolted and it comes back to a state of balance. You know, the pandemic's happening and yet you've got that sense of abiding peace. So you could measure it with things like on my ring, you can measure heart rate variability. And that's the measure of how much variation from one heartbeat to the next. Sounds like you're probably familiar with that. So that's a good measure of peace between the sympathetic nervous system, fight, flight, freeze, and the other half of the autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. So heart rate variability can measure that sense of peace between those two halves of the autonomic nervous system. Blood glucose is another one that can measure your sense of peace metabolically. Certainly blood work can do it. Cortisol, a lot of hormones indicate whether you're in a state of peace or not. Mm. But it doesn't require perfect health. That's, that's not part of it. It's more of a mindset issue. Because there is no such thing as perfect health, is there? There isn't. There's, you know, I think we all have to compare ourselves to ourselves. I think that's that's really the right way to approach it. That's certainly what I do with precision medicine. Mm. And I, I think that, you know, the nature, well, first of all, I think health is the gold standard in medicine as an industry, even though most conventional doctors don't look at it that way. We're very centered around disease, as you know. But I, I think it should be our gold standard. And it's constantly changing. <laughs> you know, the, so 
you and I were just talking about COVID. You know, I, I had a, a daughter who was sick with COVID a couple of weeks ago. She's, she's a really healthy young woman. She just turned 17. But yeah, I mean, the kind of things that she'll work on over her lifetime yeah. are these challenges that, um, yeah, she'll never be in a state of perfect health. Yeah, I think that's a false, uh, a false God. It's kind of like in today's day and age as well, we really have social media. We look at social media and we look at the way someone looks on there and we're like, oh, they must be, they got a perfect body. They got, they must be great health, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And I've had to catch myself a few times with, with those thoughts. But um, the the idea of health or the, the nature of health has changed dramatically over the course of many, many years. I mean, we're learning so much about ourselves now, diseases, you name it. But hormones is something that uh, I personally, I know they're there, <laughs> but I don't know too much about them or what they do, the impact that they have on the body. I mean, the body is so intricately designed and detailed that I'm still trying to figure it out for myself and can only imagine how you must feel. <laughs> um, but before we dive into my questions regarding hormones and, and, and all that I'm, I'm interested in. So you are a doctor, you are quite qualified to say the least. I mean, you graduated from Harvard and MIT, uh, both prestigious universities, but what sparked your interest in precision medicine? What sparked your interest in, in just medicine to begin with? Well, I didn't grow up thinking that I'd go into medicine. I actually, was planning to go into engineering. So there's no physicians in my family. And when I was in at university, I studied bioengineering and I really loved it, but I realized that a lot of engineering is being alone with the truth and, and trying to solve problems. And I, I discovered through college and also through uh, graduate school that I wanted to be in a more collaborative setting. So I wanted to work on problems, big problems, but to do it as part of a team. You know, I was, I was working on a PhD in bioengineering and I realized I cared more about my rats that I was experimenting upon than I did kind of what the results were showing. And so that was a, a moment for me where I realized I need to be more social and it just felt like medicine was a much better choice for me. So I dropped out of this PhD program and applied to medical school. And that definitely was the right choice for me because in terms of solving big problems, I feel like the human body is just endlessly fascinating. And you know, I, I think, but I still think a lot in terms of that sort of nerdy engineering approach, right? In terms of problem solving and kind of systems biology and, and thinking about, you know, not just how do you create peace, but what are the systems involved in creating peace? Like, how do you, how do you architect it? Like, what are the modules? What comes first? What comes second? What's the sequence? And I think those are really juicy, interesting questions. They are indeed. And I, I kind of, with my, I failed science and I didn't necessarily <laughs> like biology <laughs> growing up. But the, the funny thing in all that is uh, I'm speaking to a lot of doctors these days and a lot of scientists, uh, professors, you name it, and loving learning all about this stuff. But you're right, the body is like there's so many different systems within the body. I mean, you got your immune system, you got your gut system, you got your so many. Is uh is one system more important than the other than the others, or is just all of them need to be equally as healthy? You've got to look after them. It's probably a dumb question, but oh. I'm just curious. Well, first of all, I think the way that science is taught a lot of the time is not compelling. And I imagine you maybe didn't have the kind of teachers that you're talking to now with your podcast. So I just want to 
applaud you for your curiosity and love of science now. So I wouldn't say that there's a hierarchy in terms of the systems of the body. They all are so interdependent. Mm. You know, if anything, if I had to choose a hierarchy, I guess I would say that the way that these different systems, like especially the gut, the immune system, 70% of which is inside of the gut, the, um, the nervous system, like the way that those talk to the brain, yeah. kind of the input and output, that is maybe at the top of the hierarchy. And what is amazing to me is how much of that is modifiable. Like I, when I went through my medical training, we weren't really taught how modifiable it is. It wasn't until I went into functional medicine, integrative medicine, and precision medicine that I realized, wow, you can really transform your gut system within a few months, just with the food that you eat. You can dramatically transform your immune system by resolving things like trauma. So there's all this interdependence between these systems. And then, you know, I'm probably most known for my work with hormones, although that I would say that's just like the tip of the iceberg. But hormones are such an important signaling molecule. I think of hormones as being kind of like this. They're like the text message of the body where, you know, you you sort of Usually it's the brain or some endocrine gland like your thyroid or your adrenals in the back or your ovaries or your testicles. You're sending a text message to different cells of the body, telling them to change their function in some way, you know, like crank up metabolism or drive glucose into the cell. That's what insulin does or testosterone, which says, you know, get more aggressive here. Oh, are you interested in sex? How about some more muscle mass? Let's work on that. So hormones really drive what you're interested in, but they're really just a signaling molecule. Huh. And where do they sit in the body? All over the place? Or is, is there one central place in the body they just house themselves? Well, the control system is in the brain. Okay. And so the classic control system, if we talk first about sex hormones, so that's like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, Yep. Those are kind of the key hormones that determine, you know, the, the levels of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are different between men and women. And that's one of the things that leads to sex differences. Cortisol levels are about the same, although women respond differently to stress than men do. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the control system is in the brain. So the parts that, that talk to the rest of the body, the rest of the glands in the body are the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Yeah. The limbic system is also involved. So the amygdala, kind of the way that you look for threat on the horizon or in your email inbox, that's also part of this story. And that's where trauma can disrupt the control system for your hormones. Wow. And what has the thyroid got to do with, because I, 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 if you've got an overactive thyroid or an underactive thyroid, it really just buggers up all hormones. <laughs> I've noticed because <laughs> I've, yes. I've got an overactive one um, or it has a tendency to go overactive. Sorry, I've had it in the past. Uh, Mum's got an underactive one. So I struggle to put on weight, whereas mum struggles to keep, well, she's skinny, but she um, can put on weight pretty easily if she's not careful. So what has the thyroid really got to do with anything in terms of hormones? Thyroid's really important. I think of it as the, the gas pedal for your metabolism. So if we take a step back and define metabolism, metabolism is the aggregate of all of the biochemical functions in the body. So how fast or slow you burn calories is just one aspect of metabolism. But thyroid really controls that. So when you've got an overactive thyroid, also known as hyperthyroidism, you tend to make too much in the way of thyroid hormone. And so then the brain tells the thyroid to slow down production. When you have an underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism, that's where things are slowed down. So it's like the foot is taken off of the gas pedal, 
It's much easier to gain weight. You've got thyroid receptors on pretty much every cell in the body. So you can really feel it. So if you're on the slower side of hypothyroidism, you can have uh, your gut slow down. So you can have constipation. Mm. You can have slow reflexes. You can have uh, rising cholesterol. You can have hair loss because you're not kind of feeding the cells that are involved with the hair follicle. So thyroid's a really important one. It's um, It tends to affect women about seven times more than men, but there's certainly men who struggle with thyroid issues too. So why is that the case? If we're going to dive further into this, the differences between, oh, there are differences between males and females, but it seems like women tend to have a lot more trouble when it comes to their hormones. Uh, yeah. Why is that the case? Is it because they've got too many of them? Yeah, it's a great question. The hormones that women and men have are the same. It's just huh. that our levels are different. So part of it, I think, is that women are programmed to make babies. So whether you choose to or not, we've got that as part of our DNA. And it makes us more vulnerable. So women are more sensitive, for instance, to caloric restriction. We're more sensitive to stressors. We don't tend to do fight flight the way that men do. We tend to do more tend and befriend, which tends to serve us better because we've got higher levels of oxytocin. So in terms of your question of why do women have more thyroid issues, why do they have more hormone issues in general, I think it has to do with these particular biological um, vulnerabilities and also what I would think of as um, mandates. Mm. So, you know, one of the things that happens for women is that when they go from premenopause, so like up until about age 35 to perimenopause, which is typically like age 35 to 45 for women, and then menopause, which is around 50 to 52 for most women, that's that transition, especially with estrogen and progesterone, tends to trigger more thyroid issues. The other key difference, and this is really important, is that women tend to have a stronger immune response than men. So that's true whether you're talking about vaccination. So if you look, for instance, at um, I don't know if you're a vaxxer or how you feel about vaccination, but women have much more adverse side effects to vaccination than men do. Mm -hmm. We knew that before the COVID vaccine came out and the booster. But the flip side of that is that women have more autoimmune illness. Right. And about somewhere around 90% of thyroid dysfunction is related to autoimmune disease or Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves disease. And so women have much higher rates of immune issues compared to men. Wow. Now there's a positive side to that too. We have lower rates of cancer overall compared to men. So about one in two men develop cancer over their lifetime, whereas for women, it's one in three. So there are these subtle differences between the immune system for men and women. Huh. I, we also I, survived I, COVID better. This is <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my, my mom's probably going to hate me for uh, unloading all her health dirty laundry, so, so to speak, but she's a perfect case study <laughs> in this respect. Um, mom's got Hashimoto's. Uh, she had the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which literally stuffed her up in a major way. Uh, it, was, it wasn't great for autoimmune. So autoimmune was already uh, kaput. Then she had the vaccines and then it just spiraled it even more out of control. Um, okay. So does that mean that if someone is uh, immune compromised, so to speak, does that mean that the vaccine that's talking about COVID, for example, does that mean that the vaccine was not safe for her to get and receive and it didn't agree with her body at all? 
the question? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I don't know the details of your mother's story. I'd have to know the details to be able to speak to this. But what we know is that, you know, women, even though they have more adverse side effects with the vaccination, they also have better protection with the vaccination compared to men. So there are some benefits to this kind of overzealous response. But what I would say is it doesn't mean that you should avoid vaccination. What I think it means is you want to have this kind of pretty detailed conversation with a clinician or physician who really understands some of these issues so that you know what you're getting into with vaccination. I'm not, I'm personally not an anti-vaxxer. I don't want you or anyone listening to this to think that. Um, I am against vaccine mandates. That's the one thing that I'm definitely against. But also knowing your own body, speaking to your doctor about it, um, and and just, yeah, protecting yourself from getting hurt. <laughs> That's my main prerogative in life is protecting myself from getting hurt. And if I don't have to get sick from something that I don't want to get sick from, then so be it. <laughs> like, that's me. But anyway, it's the the idea of, of women's hormones and protecting yourself against um, getting sicker and sicker from diseases, that sort of thing. How can we build resilience uh, to with our hormones? Is that possible? Oh, it certainly is. So there's a lot of ways to build resilience. If we talk first about that sense of peace, mm. I think the the primary hormone that I think of with peace is cortisol. So cortisol is the stress hormone. It's kind of like a, a bully. You know, when you think of all of these hormones and they're not democratic, there's some that are more important than others. So I would say cortisol, insulin, those are some of the keystone hormones. And I even joke that cortisol is kind of like Michael cortisol Leone. Like it's a bit of a mafioso in the body. So what you want with cortisol is you want it to be in its right p- position. You don't want it too high, which was my story when I was in my 30s. And you also don't want it too low, which is what we tend to see in people who've got a history of significant trauma like an adverse childhood experience score that's higher, or even from the work of Rachel Yehuda, she's looked at Vietnam veterans, she's looked at um, people who survived the 9-11 terrorist bombings, people who survived the Holocaust and their offspring. And what she's found in those people is that cortisol tends to be too low, more of a burnt out picture. So I think a big part of resilience is trying to get that cortisol where it needs to be. So you want it high enough so that you feel productive, so that you, you know, are able to perform. You know, I think about my NBA players and I watch them, you know, go back and forth on the court. We need their cortisol to be high enough that it's stabilizing their glucose. It's helping their immune system. It's helping them, you know, jump and dunk and, you know, do all the things that they have to do on the court. So I think a big part of the work with resilience is really paying attention to your cortisol. I think that's a, it's an important place to start because when you think about some of the other hormones, like we were just talking about the thyroid, or if you're a guy with low testosterone, or you're a woman who's going through perimenopause, we can adjust those other hormones to make you more resilient. But if your cortisol is out of whack, you're only going to get kind of a short-term benefit from the other hormonal balancing. So cortisol is a really essential part of this. And then the other thing that I think is essential for resilience is insulin. Hmm. So a lot of people, their eyes start to glaze over when you talk about insulin. It's, I think of it like the, the bouncer outside of a club that determines whether you get to go in the club or not. It does that outside of cells. It determines whether glucose can go inside of the cell and fuel the cell. So if you're someone like me, I had really high insulin levels when I was in my 30s. I had high cortisol, like three times what it should have been. And then I had high insulin. I had insulin resistance, belly fat, felt 
you know, brain fog and all these symptoms related to that. So those two hormones, I think, are really important for resilience. So all the both of those two, so insulin and uh, cortisol levels, um, I wanted to come back to that in just a moment, uh, but ask you, because you mentioned that you your hormones were out of out of whack, cortisol levels, insulin. Do you know what brought all that on? Are you able to if you're comfortable sharing? Oh, sure. It was a lack of peace. <laughs> yeah, you know, so when I was in my mid-30s, I'll paint the picture for you. So I went to my doctor in my mid-30s. And I remember just like sitting on that, you know, paper sheet waiting forever for like 30 minutes. Doctors also have to wait for their doctors to come. And I I gave him my list of woes. So I had premenstrual syndrome. I had one baby. My baby was a couple of years old. And I was working at the time in MIC medicine. So I was seeing like 30 to 40 patients a day. I was just really exhausted. The only thing I looked forward to was a glass of wine at the end of the day. That was like my, you know, don't talk to me until I have a glass of wine. And so I was doing things that were making my cortisol go up to, as I described, three times what it should have been. That was also driving the belly fat issues that I had. I checked my fasting glucose. I had prediabetes. I had a fasting glucose of about 105, 110. My insulin was high. I had all these problems and I thought I was a pretty healthy 35 year old. You know, I was running four miles, four times a week. I was eating pretty well, maybe drinking a little too much. But a lot of what I was doing, I would say my mindset, like how stressed I would get at work and how activated, you know, oh my God, that patient's 15 minutes late. I don't want to see her. Like I would get so reactive and that just feeds some of these hormone issues that we're talking about. So it was pulling my cortisol out of whack, making my insulin rise, making my blood sugar rise. That was then pulling my thyroid out of balance. It was making me estrogen dominant. I wasn't making as much progesterone, which is that lovely hormone that's kind of like Xanax. It just helps you soothe yourself. The alcohol was not helping. So I thought it was helping me with my stress, but it actually raises your cortisol even further. The very thing you think you're getting from alcohol, it's not really giving to you. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a moment where I went to my doctor, I had my list and he was just like, I think you should go on an antidepressant. And uh, how about a, a birth control pill? And then he wrote on a little whiteboard, exercise more plus eat less <laughs> to lose weight because I still had some baby fat. And that was the moment, Jay, where I was just like, oh, if I'm being told this and I'm a doctor, there are so many millions of people around the world who are being told this and it is wrong. It is totally wrong. You know, this idea of exercise more and eat less. I was already restricting my food. I was already running 16 miles a week. The answer was not more running. That was also raising my cortisol too much. So that's where I left this office, had one of those catalyst moments that you referred to went to the lab and that's where I saw these hormone issues. And that kind of led to me becoming a writer and really thinking about, okay, if conventional medicine is failing me, how can we change the conversation for other people so that they understand the importance of hormones? They understand the importance of ownership of their health. So that was a key pivot for me. Thank you for sharing that because the reason why I did ask you that question in particular and dive further into it was because there are there are a lot of people out there that don't know love what's going on. They're just walking around, they're kind of like in a little bit of a daze, so to speak. They know they're feeling bad, but they don't really know what's going on. They'll go see their doctor. The doctor will just prescribe them some medication, just say, you know, you feel better, so to speak move on next patient. And I'm not saying it's the doctor's fault at all, but I feel like there should be some more research done into that person in particular. Um, So how did you 
fix yourself? How did you get those levels back to normal? Was it going on medication? Was it changing your diet? Was it getting informed? What was some of the things that you did to fix your, your levels? Well, I had always known about integrative medicine and at that moment, you know, with, with these prescriptions in hand, I did what a lot of doctors do when they're starting to build a bridge from conventional medicine to more integrative and functional medicine, like the work that Will Cole does. And I decided to use some supplements. So I did change my diet. Ultimately, I cut out some of those foods that tend to cause food stress, like gluten and dairy. I was intolerant of those things. And it was actually raising my cortisol even further. I also took a few supplements. So one of the supplements that's been shown in randomized trials, which is the gold standard of conventional medicine for whether a drug helps you or not. uh, One of those supplements was phosphatidylserine. It's kind of a mouthful, phosphatidylserine. Also fish oil. Fish oil has been shown to lower cortisol. So I started both of those. And within four weeks, my cortisol went from three times what it should have been back to the normal range. And that's where I realized I was onto something. So I started to layer in more dietary changes. I started to cut back on how much I was drinking, which really helped. And then I also started to work on some of those lifestyle things that really help with cortisol. So picked up meditation again. I've always had a yoga practice. I recommitted to it. I started to do less running and more adaptive exercise. So yoga, Pilates, things like that. So that's that's what really changed things for me. But I would say those levers of diet, lifestyle, especially the way that we observe our mind objectively, and then uh, supplements, those were really what were the biggest needle movers for me. For someone that struggles immensely to lose weight, um, this could be for a, a male and a female, they've, they've taken supplements, they're, they're exercising, they have a, a pretty decent diet, if not a good one, and they're still struggling to lose weight. Has that got anything to do with your hormones being out of whack too, or is there something else going on there? Well, there's a lot of different reasons for what I would call weight loss resistance, which is what you're describing. So there's from a precision medicine framework, we think in terms of genetics. So genetics first, it provides a blueprint, kind of like the hardware for your body. And I can tell you when I first ran my genetic panel about 15, 20 years ago, I was just like, oh, wow, I'm surprised I don't weigh 200 pounds. I mean, this is actually really bad news, kind of seeing what I inherited. So genetics is a big part of it. I have the FTO gene, which programs me to be obese. It also tells me that I do better if I have lower carbohydrates and I have a lot of uh, physical exercise. I've got another gene that just makes me have kind of a lifelong problem with satiety, with feeling full. And so knowing that, knowing that I could work around them was very helpful. And then what I recommend with weight loss resistance, in addition to a genetics panel, is to to test your hormones. So measuring your base case, like what's going on with cortisol, what's going on with insulin, what's your fasting insulin, what's your hemoglobin A1C, what's your testosterone, total and free testosterone, What's, what's going on with your thyroid? What about growth hormone? So all of those things I think are really value, valid to measure if you're struggling with weight. And then the third part, which has been another revelation for me, is continuous glucose monitoring. Mm. And this is kind of a juicy area, Jay, because one of the things I see happening is that there's this democratization of health data. And I think that is so exciting because, you know, it used to be that you would go to your doctor once a year and check your fasting glucose, maybe a hemoglobin A1C. If you're struggling with your weight, maybe you would do a finger stick and kind of see what's going on with your glucose. But mostly you would just get ruled out for diabetes. You wouldn't be able to personalize your diet based on your glucose response to bread versus 
beans versus, you know, beer. So being able to personalize it, putting the power in the hands of the individual, that is incredibly powerful. That is so exciting to me. So I've worn a continuous glucose monitor for about four years. And I think it's probably the most powerful tool that I've ever seen in myself, as well as in my precision medicine practice for really helping people break through weight loss resistance. Wow. This is, uh, this is fascinating stuff. <laughs> Dr. Gottfried, I understand that your time is incredibly valuable. So with the, the time that we do have left together, I, I wanted to ask you a few final questions, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. Age. And I think that is a, a pretty significant factor <laughs> for a lot of things. Um, how, at the older we get, uh, how can we learn to take better care of ourselves and our hormones as we, as we get age? Are we just, as we get older, are we doomed to just get progressively worse and worse? Or can we reduce it or stop it altogether, even though we do get old? <laughs> Yeah, there's now six different studies that have been published showing that you can reverse biological age. Yeah. So we're we're in just an incredible era right now of being able to, to architect a life that slows down the aging process. And I think that is so important to, to really feel and accept and kind of take on as a goal. Don't outsource it to your doctor because your doctor is not thinking along these lines. Mm. Probably there's a few who think along these lines. I've got a book called younger where I specifically addressed this particular issue, but what we're learning, I mean, it's not really that shocking, Jay, the kind of foods, for instance, that help you with slowing down the aging process with reversing biological age are things like greens, like eat your vegetables. Like this is not a revelation. But often we need to remind ourselves that, you know, you're supposed to get six to 11 servings of vegetables a day. And a lot of us, you know, we go for the comfort food or we just skip that part. You know, you have a choice between a salad and a pizza and the pizza sounds a lot better in the moment. But we need to present value that aging arc, right? We want to be thinking about, okay, what is my, what does my body want so that 30 years from now, I'm making the right choices so that I don't have Alzheimer's disease, so that I don't have other chronic diseases. I don't have high blood pressure. It's the decisions that you make, especially in your 30s, 40s, 50s, that really impact your future risk. Yeah. So that includes uh, methylating um, vegetables, so the dark leafy greens, choline, which you get from eggs and from chicken. Beets are really rich in methylators. They contain betaine. And then the other thing that's really helpful is what are known as methylating adaptogens. Mm. So that includes green tea. Decaf green tea also can be helpful. It includes um, some of these lifestyle practices that we've talked about, you know, sleeping mm. at least seven hours a night. Less than that is associated with an accelerated clip with aging and meditating, even meditating for 10 minutes can make such a big difference in terms of the aging process at the level of your cells. Yeah. And if people want to know or learn more about this stuff, um, Dr. Gottfried has a, a new book that was released last year. It's called Women, Food and Hormones. You can learn more at a website, Sarah Gottfried, MD. Dot com. Dr. Sarah, where do you want uh, people to learn more about you if they are interested, if they do want to reach out and ask for help, that sort of thing? Where do you want people to go? The website's probably the best place, sarahgottfriedmd.com. The other place that I hang out right now is Instagram. So you can certainly interact with me there. Amazing. I'll make sure everyone knows where to get a copy of your new book. This has been a, a really fascinating conversation for me. Uh, I've Really, really enjoyed it. My final question for you, Dr. Gottfried. This is my all-time favorite question. I ask all my guests at the very end of my conversations. It's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together 
a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Then ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Well, I feel like this connects back to your original question, which is about success. And I love how you frame this question because it's almost like a, like on your deathbed, you know, I hope at age hundred, I'm still super vital and I'm going to the weddings with my great grandchildren and like dancing shamelessly. Um, but I, you know, what I hope is that that feeling of peace together with service from that divine essence, from that place of, you know, kind of the inner divinity. I hope that those two things are what come through in that movie. It's a perfect send off message. Dr. Godfrey, thank you so much for your time today, your wisdom, your advice, and for answering all my questions. Some of them I know were, <laughs> were crazy. <laughs> and if my pleasure. Sense, thank you. Thank you for helping me out there. But thank you so much for, for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Awesome. And please thank your mom for uh, allowing her to be one of the cases for our conversation today. Being, being my guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna love listening back to this i guarantee you she's gonna oh, go, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much thanks jay